Hey everyone, this is May with Fandom Spotlight, and today we are talking with Cliff Simon. You probably know him as Ball from Stargate, or from his own show, Into the Unknown, or Americans, or many other roles. How are you doing today? Great, May. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it, and great to meet you. Thank you. No problem. Glad to have you. So, of course, we're all stuck at home. How's the pandemic been treating you? Uh, you know what it is? I mean, it's been a crazy time, but last year, uh, around about June, my wife and I decided we're not sitting around Los Angeles. There's nothing else to do. Uh, we've been wanting to do a, a huge road trip for a long, long time. And this actually, it was the perfect time to go. Um, okay. So we hit the road and we have very good friends in Georgia. Uh, they have a lake house. And we made our, we started our road trip, went up north and right through Montana, Wyoming, all the way back down to Georgia and spent a couple of months with our friends. And uh, we actually just finished the road trip. Uh, we flew, I flew back to LA for some work and then went back. Uh, I left my truck in Georgia and we just finished the road trip like three weeks ago. We went down all the way through Florida to the Keys and back up. So I kind of took advantage of the whole pandemic situation. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, the only the only thing that wasn't great was like going through a place like Nashville. Nothing was open. Uh, love your cats. Oh, yes, man. We have five. They love to be in the video. Well, if my Jake comes in, I'll show you him. Uh, he's great. Uh, so yeah, that's what we did during the pandemic, and now we're back, and you know it's still carrying on. But I kind of took advantage of it. I didn't. There was no ways I could sit around the house. I'm too. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't know. I got to be outdoors. I got to be doing my thing. To be happy. Well, yeah. we're glad to hear it didn't hit you hard. Yeah, and luckily, I mean, I've been, everyone I know has been uh, healthy, and um, I think I got sick in March. I still believe I got it way back in March. Yeah. For three days, I was, like, off my feet, but nobody knew anything about it then. Um, so, yeah. Good. Now, of course, we have to talk balls. Um, yeah. <laughs> what would you say <laughs> is the best part of being a god? Uh, hey, people listen to me when I talk. Yeah. Especially when my eyes glow, you know. Um, no, you know what? I just, I love playing the character. Well, I wouldn't even say the character of Baal because Baal was just me. I just brought myself into the character. Um, I knew exactly how I wanted to play him. And I was really just myself, my sense of humor. And it just worked out with um, O'Neill that they, we had this banter going on and it just worked. We didn't know. I didn't know my character would work the way it worked when I started there. I, you know, you take a chance as an actor and you hope it works and it worked. Uh, so it was a very satisfying feeling from that. But yeah, I mean, Baal, well, what a great character playing a guy. It's kind of in, in your normal day to day life, you have to tone things down. You have to tone your ego down. You have to tone down your, if you feel like a criminal and you don't want to pay a parking at a parking meter like yeah. well i'm not going to put in a quarter um you feel all like woo but as a god you can just do whatever you want and you don't care about the consequences because you're a god so there really aren't consequences and that that was the whole thing about ball he just did what he wanted to do which and was I great think, yeah and i think what you that you brought yourself into him made him likable because he was more relatable he wasn't like up there he felt like kind of have a conversation with them and he wouldn't be just beyond but yeah you know that's the whole thing with any character as an actor any character you you uh play or portray you want to make them as realistic as possible and you want them to be relatable even a bad guy um people need to relate so you try and humanize him you try and make him he has to be three-dimensional you know he has to be he has to have emotions um, you can't just be a two-dimensional bad guy. It gets very boring very quickly. Um, so, and you know, all the best, I like to all use this analogy, like the best or the worst serial killers that we've ever known in our lifetime, they've all been the most, um, most of them have been the most uh, charming people. And yeah. they're the kind of people that smile before they kill you. And that's yeah. a bad guy. Any guy who smiles before he attacks you is a very, very dangerous person. Um, not likable. <laughs> yeah, not likable, but you, you, he's the bad guy you love to hate. You never know what he's going to do when he's on screen. And, you know, yeah. that's the kind of characters I love to watch when I'm watching a movie. Now, in playing him, 
how much extra work went into the clone episode insider you had to just see everywhere yeah that was an amazing episode i heard you know of course i knew i read the script and i saw all these clones and i'm like i'd done some cgi and green screen work before but not as much as i was about to experience on that episode so that for me it was a real learning experience as well and um it was phenomenal because as we were shooting they would i would go and watch a replay of the scene but they would overlay the scenes so i could actually see myself standing next to myself and i'd never seen that before uh, and the fact that they could do it on set at that moment uh, obviously it wasn't the finished product but i could get an idea of what it looked like it was pretty phenomenal um excuse me but that was that was a real learning experience for me and it was a lot of fun it took a long long time Uh, that episode was a lot of work, and I know it cost a lot of money. Um, so, but it was great, and it was yeah. I was honored that they gave me my own episode, really, which was phenomenal. Yeah, the yeah. best episode in my opinion. Thank um, you. Now, speaking of CGI, you've worked with a lot of CGI elements. Was yeah. there anything that was particularly hard to imagine working with? Um, you know what I found challenging with that is I knew in my head I didn't want. there was 20 balls or 21 balls or something and i knew visually as an audience watching the show they had to be different they couldn't all be the same otherwise it would just be like there was a mirror each one had to have some kind of uh, identity something different the way he walked or the way he looked or his some kind of emotion that was different so i tried my best to do that and if you notice i and i also tried to make the main ball looked like the main ball and the other ones make them a little bit more uh, skittish um maybe like a bit more confused mm. so i didn't i couldn't have every single one of them being the big ball yeah. uh, it would have been kind of crazy to do that so that was kind of challenging and then i had to remember which one like the one that was standing in the corner i had to remember mm. what i did with him and then because mm. when i had to go and play him again I had to know yeah. what he was like so that was kind of interesting and then there was one one part where I came in and I put my arm on my shoulder yeah I had a gun and that was the main ball as far as I was concerned but that actually I came up with that idea I was like guys I have to put I have to touch one of these other clones like something mm-hmm. and I said let's just try it you know and they were like clip this is like a $35,000 shot we have to get it right if we're going to do it you know the expensive so time we'll yeah so we just did it you know we put up um a a mic stand and mm-hmm. we measured my shoulder and i mean of course i know more or less my height but we measured exactly where my shoulder was and we put a mark on it and i walked in and and just rested my hand on the top of the stand and it just worked perfectly it worked on the first take it was fantastic wow uh, Yeah. So they were really happy and I was happy because it was kind of something they'd never done that in the show either so it was kind of a challenge for everyone but luckily yeah, it worked otherwise uh, they would have maybe not paid me that week I don't know <laughs> well especially for the time it was the CGI and that was great so everyone did a good job yeah and they were way I mean that show was way ahead of its time just tech- technologically wise you know with everything you know now you've also been working on your own show into the unknown Um do you have a favorite experience filming that and where would you like to take the series in the future? Yeah, I mean, you know what number one that was just such a I'd been working on that show with a creator for four years before it got picked up by Travel Channel. So it's not something that happens overnight. It's mm-hmm. a lot of work and a lot of changes and a lot of pitching of shows. Um but the whole show the whole experience and the places we went to were phenomenal. Um I had a very tight crew four guys with me one three guys and my director and me um all very adventurous guys and these are guys that they will go anywhere with me if i like i did i crossed the river they'll come with me if i jumped off a cliff they would jump with me just <laughs> to get shot uh climbing a mountain climbing mount shasta they right there with me and i mean i'm a lot older than all of them and i was struggling and they were struggling to keep up with me because we kind of had this Good. unspoken competition it's like Hey, you're 35. Like I'm in my 50s and I'm going to beat you to the top of that mountain and they're like there's no way you're going to beat me. So there was this competition uh, which made it even better. Um but the places we went to were phenomenal and they were chosen specifically for the first season. 
we have a lot more places to go. Um, but I think the two episodes that really resonated with me, one was Hawaii because Hawaii, I love Hawaii. I love the, the spirituality of Hawaii and I love the Hawaiian native people. They are unbelievable people. And Kelly E and his, um, his little protege, they're the guys that actually did my tattoo for me or my marking, I should call it. Uh, just the most unbelievable guys. Um, I really had a, a real spiritual experience with them. Uh, and everything in the show was real. That was my whole thing with the show and also being an exec producer on it. I wanted it to be, I think I'm quite a down to earth person and I wanted it to be as real as possible. I didn't want to show a fake ghost sitting in the corner because that's yeah. not what we saw. If we see it, we're going to catch it on camera. Sure. But if we don't see it, we don't see it. But I know there was a lot of things in every episode, everywhere we went, there was a lot of things going on. Uh, we heard them, I could feel them, but it was very hard to see them. And that's normally what happens. Uh, but the whole idea of the show is to show that there are these very paranormal, these uh, places that have a lot of paranormal activity going on. And a lot of people experience it and they're not able to capture it. But that's why it's paranormal because we can't capture it yet. Yeah. One day when we can, it's going to become normal. Um, you know, and then we'll move on to the next thing. But Hawaii definitely had a big impact on me. And Louisiana, the swamps, are uh, that's a place I've always wanted to go my entire life because it is the creepiest place on earth. The Louisiana swamps are creepy. And that's all I can say about mm -hmm. it. And even the people that live there will tell you it's a very creepy, scary place. Um, yeah, it's a scary place. <laughs> but the show as a whole was phenomenal. My crew were amazing. And you know, we're hoping it's, uh, I just heard the other day it's going on to Discovery Plus, uh, the first season. So we're hoping we can build an audience there and, you know, hopefully get to season two. And anyone who's watching this, please write to Discovery and tell them what an amazing show it is. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of unique experiences, you wrote a book about your time at the Moulin Rouge. And without giving too much away, what sort of exploits can readers look forward to? Okay, uh, well, besides all the, besides the show, which is unbelievable place, I mean, it's a world-renowned cabaret place. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> I, wanted the, I wanted the book to be about the Moulin Rouge because it's such an amazing place, but I also wanted to touch on various aspects of my life, a little bit about growing up in South Africa, um, a little bit about the military in South Africa. I didn't want to go into all of that because that's not what the book was about, but I touched on it because people needed to know where I come from and why I am the kind of person that I am. And how did this guy who was an Olympic hopeful swimmer becomes a soldier and then becomes a dancer at the Moulin Rouge in Paris. That's like, it's just such a ridiculous story. <laughs> yeah. You know, if somebody wrote a script like that, they would, it would be like, guys, this is just stupid. This is, <laughs> so it's one of those things again, that you just, you couldn't write a better story. So it was my journey, how I got there, and everything was organic. Um, one thing just led to the next. Uh, my main exploit in Paris was, I mean, at one stage, I was approached by to get diamonds from South Africa, um, smuggle diamonds out of the country. And, of course, names were changed. I still, to this day, I respect the guys I was involved with, and I really liked them. We were friends. Uh, but it was very, it was a scary, scary time because I got involved in something I, sh I didn't know. I mean, I knew I was getting involved in something, but I didn't really know the consequences, what the consequences could be. And I'm lucky I got out of it. But so, yeah, I got involved a little bit with Mafia and some guys and they wanted diamonds. And I said, OK, I know how to do it. And, you know, if I did it, I, who knows, I might have either been very wealthy today or I would be sitting in prison, or I would be dead. And more than likely, I would be dead or sitting in prison. <laughs> so, yeah. so, I mean, so that was one of the exploits. I mean, Paris is the center of the world, and it still is to this day. Everything that goes on in the world goes through Paris, whether it's drugs, prostitution, money, whatever. It's just such a vibrant place. It's still one of my favorite cities in the world. And I just met such amazing people in the show and outside of the show. I was there with my best friend, uh, Gavin, who was working in the show with me. And he is a crazy mofo. <laughs> I, 
awesome dude. I mean, we were very, very tight, me and him. And yeah, we just had a great time. It was a phenomenal place. Uh, yeah, I had incidences on the street with prostitutes throwing wine in my face. I had a prostitute who fell in love with me for no reason other than I was nice to her. <laughs> that, that'll do it. <laughs> Uh, it's Paris. What can I say? It's just was a phenomenal time of my life. And it was, uh, and writing the book for me was kind of therapy, uh, especially with, I wrote about the military. Uh, that helped me a lot because I was, I, I got a lot of things going on in my head still from those days and stuff that only comes out later on in life. It starts to affect you. So it helped me with that. It helped me writing about my dad. Um, yeah. So it really helped. It was therapy for me. And, uh, you know, whoever's read the book, they've loved it, and which is great. Yep. And we'll we'll put a link in the description so you can get that book. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad that that was so helpful. And yeah. some of your other projects, uh, as an animal lover myself, I love seeing all your advocacy for anti-poaching and trafficking. How did that become your main passion? You know what? I've always I've always been an animal lover since I was a little boy. When my first pets I had were uh, pigeons. I used to breed pigeons, believe it or not. My dad built me an aviary and I had pigeons. One day they all got wiped out by a cat. Every single pigeon and every egg that they had was wiped out by cats that got into the aviary. Um, that was the first pets I had. And then, you know, my mom bought me like every little boy. I got my golden lab when I was in primary school, like maybe, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. And I've always just felt an affinity with animals. I've always felt I'm happiest when I'm with animals. Even if I'm out on the ocean and I'm paddle surfing and I'm kiteboarding and I see dolphins or I see whales, it just gives me such a sense of calm. It's just, I don't know, I think maybe the way and where I grew up coming from South Africa, coming from a very aggressive society, uh, I kind of learned to distrust people a little bit. And I found the, uh, the love, the un, just pure love you get from an animal they just want to be with you and they don't care what kind of person you are. I mean, of course, if you're abusing them, they're going to try and run, but they don't care. They don't know if, if you're in a bad mood, they'll be with you. If you're happy, they'll be with you. And if you're in a bad mood, they'll put you in a good mood. They just <laughs> a symbiotic relationship with an animal for sure. Definitely with dogs and cats. They, they understand us and we understand them. Um, yeah. I think it's just a feeling I've always felt comfortable around animals. I've never been scared of any animal in my life. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's relatable. I would I would pet a tiger and die, but you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've had opportunities, you know, to do those kind of things, and I've I've gone ahead in Africa, some in a rehab place. I was playing with some lions and cheetahs, and I just thought, you know what? It's just it comes down to respect. Even my little cat. You've got a cat. If yeah. I tease my cat, <laughs> he comes after me. He actually chases me, and his ears get yeah. flat. And, yeah. and, I'm like, and I do it occasionally to, to do that because I can see he knows instantly if I'm not respecting him and he wants to get me. And mm -hmm. it's the same with any big cat. You do that to any big animal, any wild animal. If you corner them and they, feel, they sense something from you, they're going to attack. That's what they do. You know, so it's all about respect. Just respect animals. Same as people. If people just respected everybody, things would be, you know, the world would be a lot better place. Yeah. Very simple. No. Switching gears, you've been to a lot of cons to meet fans, one involved body shot. Uh, but aside from that, was there a fan interaction that sticks out in your mind? Uh, there's been so many. Yeah, I mean, the fans, number one, are all phenomenal. The sci-fi, the sci Stargate fans in particular are unbelievable. They're just so passionate and behind whatever you do. Uh, just they, they latch onto the actor. And they latch onto Cliff Simon, for instance, and they'll watch anything I do. And they're behind and they'll try and promote it for me and do whatever I can, which is unbelievable. Not a lot of actors get that, uh, but the sci-fi people are like that. But one of the things I still tell a story about today is there was a couple, and if they're watching this, I apologize. I can't remember their names. But they, I met them, I think, at a convention in England right in the beginning, years and years ago. And then the next convention I met them at, they had a little baby. And they said, oh, this baby was conceived at the last convention. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't have anything to do with that. But thanks for taking yeah. it. <laughs> anyway, they, every year, I, I would see them just about every year at all the conventions. 
And I watched their little baby boy grow up and they would dress him as a little baby ball. To go to, <laughs> and they made him the most amazing outfits. And the guy is now like in his 20s, I think. Wow. And he's an actor. And oh. we inspired him to become an actor. He wanted to become an actor and they, they pushed him and they helped him to become an actor. And, you know, I, I don't know how he's doing. I hope he's doing well. But, I mean, I watched this guy grow up from being a baby to now being a, he's a man and he's yeah. an actor. And that is just so unbelievable for, for me that I could inspire somebody like that to do something, follow his dream and follow something that he wanted to do. So that's quite a, that's a story that just sticks in my mind because I saw these people the whole time and you become, you become close to people. And when you see them again, it's kind of like you're seeing a friend, even though of course it's kind of like I say, I can't remember their name. Like they have to excuse me, I meet thousands and thousands of people, but yeah. I know them and it's unbelievable. So that's a great story. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. All right. Our speed round. Favorite color. Favorite color? Speed orange. Round. Ooh. Favorite ice cream? Caramel. Caramel. People have to bring you that now. Favorite season of the year? Summer. Nice. Your favorite book? Paris Nights, My Year at the Moulin Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Your I actually, favorite... to be honest, I don't, I don't read books, so I couldn't really say that. Oh, your mm -hmm. favorite musical group? Uh, sure, Toto. Nice. Nice. Yeah. All right. Now, any new projects you can discuss? I can discuss. We have a show called Land of the Free, which is in development. Um, it is a, it started off, I've already done narration for the trailer, which is going to be, it was going to the Cannes Film Festival. And unfortunately that's just been canceled this year. So it's delaying things a little bit, but we're still going to get it done. So, so we're going to shoot the documentary Land of the Free, which is all the story is about the Safari Club International and illegal trophy hunting in South Africa. Yeah. I'm narrating the documentary the feature documentary, and then there's a movie planned after that where I am playing the, one of the characters in the movie. Uh, back in 2000, there was a Australian Special Forces guy who infiltra infiltrated the uh, Safari Club International to go on a hunt with him, go on an illegal hunt. And mm -hmm. that's the character I play. So he got all this undercover footage. Uh, so we're going to name names, people. Uh, we got it on film. We got it on camera, what they do. Uh, not just in, not just in the USA, but South African people as well who breed lions for hunting. Uh, that's what they do, and their excuse is that it's for conservation, but it's not for conservation. It's for money, right? Yeah. And it's illegal, and it shouldn't be allowed. Uh, it's cruel and it's inhumane. And I mean, the footage that people see, it's going to be shocking. I've seen it, and it is very shocking. Um, the way they hunt, it's not just picking up a rifle and shooting an animal. Uh, it's very inhumane and very, very cruel. Uh, as an example, using a pack of dogs to bring down a cheetah and rip it apart. You know, uh, so stuff like that. It's very hard to watch. And we hope it has an impact, and I think it will have an impact. Uh, the other project we have is a sci-fi trilogy film series called El Mythia, which is a co-Australian-American production. Um, there's been a lot of delays with the show, but we're hoping it's moving forward. It's a fantastic project. The character I play or want to play is, uh, his name is Grey Paul. He's like an Obi-Wan Kenobi. He is a master. Uh, and in the story, he teaches the young guy how to kill the bad guys. Um, beautiful story. Like I said, it's, a, it's actually a book series uh, being turned into three movies. Uh, so huge budgets. And we were hoping this year it was going to start. But COVID, of course, has just delayed everything. So those are the two big projects in the pipeline. And, of course, hopefully more seasons of my own show. Um, yeah. And we can only, we hope, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll keep an eye out for those. Another exciting thing that's happening, uh, I'm starting up a Cliff Simon Ball fan club uh, through jemmy.app, jemmy.app. Um, I think a lot of people know that already. That's where you can you can pick up some personalized autograph photographs. I do hangout meetings and et cetera, et cetera. But as of this next weekend, which is around about Valentine's Day, I chose this time specifically. 
Uh, people are going to be able to sign up uh, for my fan club. Uh, very reasonable rates, monthly rates. You'll get exclusive access to photographs I do in my private time, maybe on the beach, stuff that's never posted on social media. Uh, we do Zoom hangout meetings. And with time, there's going to be tier one and tier two. But at the moment, we'll have tier one, uh, which is the fan club membership. Uh, tier two will be a VIP access where there'll be more Zoom meetings. Um, but please go along at, to jemmy.app forward slash cliff and uh, see what I have to offer. And please sign up for the fan club. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you. Awesome. Thank and you. finally, any message for your fans? Yeah, you know, as usual, I just thank the fans for so many years of unwavering support. Um, they're phenomenal. Like I said, you know, they support us as actors in anything, anything else we go and do. Um, what is amazing is that the original supporters of the show have now introduced their kids to the show. So we have a whole new wave of fans, people who uh, weren't even alive when we finished shooting the show. When we finished shooting the show, they yeah. were in the mall, <laughs> and they're a fan. And I'm like, how do you know me? How do you know Bob? They're like, because my parents made me watch the DVDs. So <laughs> it's unbelievable. We're getting generations of fans now. I don't think it's ever happened except for Star Trek. Um, but we've outdone Star Trek many times over. Much respect to them. But yeah. <laughs> this is a big, big franchise. And thank you to all the fans. And um, I hope I kept you all entertained. And hopefully we'll be back. That's all I can say. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will put links to everything you mentioned in the description as well as where to find Cliff on social media. Thank you all for watching and as always have fun and follow your fandom. Hi, this is Cliff Simon and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share and subscribe. Your God commands it. Oh, and I command you to have fun and follow your fandom. <laughs>